Welcome to Church on Sunday at Stretton Baptist Church. It's so good to have you here with us. I want to say that this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let us welcome God into our service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a new day. We thank you, Father God, for your loving kindness towards us. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for watching over us through the night and through the day. Lord, we welcome you into our service today. We want to worship and adore you for your goodness towards us. Father, be present with us. Holy Spirit, fill us with joy today that we remember the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Thank you, Jesus, that you brought us into relationship with the Father, that today we can worship you from our hearts. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, my brothers and sisters. We've been looking at the theme of lamentations over this month. And we've been looking at how God is with us, even when things seem to be going wrong. We know that when we cry out to him in our trouble, he hears us and he rescues us. The Bible says that God is near us, even in our mouth. Therefore, with our mouths, we're going to raise up joyful praise to the Lord as we worship in song together. Let's sing praises to the Lord. A number of people have said to me that they really miss gathering together to worship God. But we need to remind ourselves that nothing can prevent us worshipping God in the sanctuary of our own hearts. This morning I've chosen songs for personal worship and intimacy. And I pray that wherever you are, and whatever you're doing, these will help you to engage with God and encounter him afresh. It's 
sorry for the things I've learned When it's all about you It's all about you
As believers, we are encouraged to stay in faith, even when we don't understand what's going on. But we do know that even in tough times, even in dark times, there's light and great things do happen. So I want to share with you some good news that we had from Narissa and her family. Watch this with us. Morning church. This is our, our these are our new arrivals to our family. Um, we had our twins on the 16th of August and his name's Rufus and he was born six pounds one and her name is Maya and she was born five pounds one and they keep us up at night a lot of the time but we love them so much and it has been amazing to have them in our lives. Oh, such wonderful news, Narissa. Thank God for those children. Thank God for your life. Thank God you've come through this so joyfully. I also wanted to share something funny from a couple in our church. I hand over to Diane and James Moore. I'd been on my own for quite a few years, but praying that I would meet the right woman. Early in 2012, I felt prompted to buy some rather expensive aftershave as a prophetic act that I might meet her that year. I was also looking for a local church and I felt the Lord prompting me to try the little church just round the corner from me. And I did. And I was immediately warmly welcomed and made to feel at home when I began to attend this church. After I'd been going for a few weeks, I encountered Diane and found her very easy to talk to and we both seemed to enjoy our conversations. But as she always had Hester with her, I'd assume she must be married. But in the course of our conversations, I discovered she was actually on her own, and friendship developed, and we began to spend some time together. It was on one of those days we discovered the significance of the aftershave. I uh, was a single parent. I'd parted from an abusive relationship several years earlier, and I was now ready to trust God to bring the right man into my life. I'd even joined a Christian dating site. And then I saw James across the crowded church and I had to wait weeks for him to speak to me. But I was pleased to get to know him and enjoyed our talks and our walks. And one day I just mentioned to him the list I'd been encouraged to write, 10 things that I would want in a perfect partner. And I also mentioned my cheeky PS to the Lord about um, a tall, slim man who wears nice aftershave, that that would be a bonus. And it was then that I learned about James's prophetic purchase of expensive aftershave. And the rest is history. We were married in 2013 and we thank God for hearing our prayers and fulfilling Jeremiah 29 verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. And it was then I began to use the aftershave and I threw the receipt away. <laughs> oh, thank you, James. Thank you, Diana. That's such a lovely story. Yes, God truly does 
answer prayer. Obviously, there's so much going on in the world and in our nation. So we want to have a time now of prayer together. So we're going to put up the scriptures that we're going to pray around and the topics that we're going to pray for. We're going to start off by praying for our government. We want to pray for wisdom and courage for our government at this time. Let us pray in silence. We now want to pray for God's protection over us from COVID, that God keeps this thing away from us, from us, our family, our friends, our work colleagues, that this plague stops in Jesus' name. Let's pray. We're going to pray for businesses that are closing down and people who are losing their jobs. We're going to pray that God will make a way where there seems to be no way. We'll give faith and courage to people who've had to close down their businesses and have been made redundant. Let us pray. We're going to pray for those who are sick from COVID or any other illness. Let us pray. We are praying now for those who've been bereaved through this season, praying that God will comfort them, will be with them and uphold them. Let us pray. We're going to pray for financial needs at this time when people are uncertain about their financial future. We're going to pray that God will supply because we can only trust in him as our source. Let us pray.
we're going to pray for those people who are struggling with mental health issues, anxiety, worry, fretting, concerned about what to do next, what's going to happen next. We need to pray for one another. Let us pray. And finally, we're going to pray for our children. They must be so confused, worried, scared, anxious. And we pray especially for those children whose parents have died via COVID. Let's pray. In all this, we ask for your intervention, Lord. We trust in you. We ask you for your comfort, Father. We ask you for your peace, Lord Jesus. And we ask you for your guidance, Holy Spirit. We pray this in the magnificent name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Psalm 121 says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. At this time, it's important for us to really get close to God. So one encouragement to you, my brothers and sisters, is dig deeper into God at this season. Pray more, search the scriptures more, Draw closer to God. Give him more of your time. We can only get the answers to tough questions for the power of the Holy Spirit. So draw nearer to God and he will draw nearer to you. We are now going to have our notices. On Monday the 20th of September, we have the church members meeting at 8 p.m. If you'd like to be in the building at the time, please book in by phoning the church office. Otherwise, the rest of us will meet on Zoom at 8 p.m. The Zoom link is on the website and the password will be in the bulletin. There'll be some emails sent out regarding the matters we'll discuss at the church members meeting. So please do check your emails and read the papers before the meeting. That'll be much appreciated. On Monday the 5th of October we have Alpha, so please do pray for the attendees. If you'd like to be part of Alpha this year, contact Rachel Waite on her email address or call her or call the church office. Next Sunday the 4th of October we have Harvest. Any money collected will go to Tear Fund International COVID Work. If you'd like to bring in some items, you can do so between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. from Tuesday to Friday next week. If you check the bulletin, it will tell you what kind of items are suitable. Just to remind you that every Sunday after this service at 12 o'clock, we meet up for a Zoom meetup. The link is sent in the email that you get regarding the Sunday service. On Thursday at 7.45, we are meeting together for the Connections Prayer Meeting. This is a prayer meeting for the whole church and you're very much welcome to be a part of it. The Zoom link is on the website. 
If you'd like to be prayed for today, there's a link on your screen for prayer. If you click it, the prayer team will acknowledge that you've asked for prayer and will pray with you at the end of the service. We are now closing the option for private prayer until further notice. That's the end of the notices. This Sunday, as we wrap up our look at Lamentations, we're actually going to look at Psalm 137. We're now going to have the reading. Good morning, uh, Streatham Baptist Church. I'm really glad to be here to share with you uh, another in your series of messages on lamentation and worship. I understand that uh, the other preachers in this series have been choosing passages or, or given passages from the book of Lamentations. Uh, I was offered a free choice, uh, still on the theme of lamentation and worship, and so I chose Psalm 137. I thought, why not go in at the deep end? Uh, we've been struggling, many of us, through the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And there's been many emotions and feelings that have come up within us during this time. And it's been a very challenging time. So I'm Steve Latham, and uh, I'm the pastor of King's Cross Baptist Church in central London. And like you, uh, we've been dealing with a lot of the issues that have risen up uh, during this time. Uh, not only the pandemic itself, but issues of poverty and inequality in our society have been uh, highlighted during the pandemic. And also issues to do with race and justice have been highlighted, as we've seen in the United States, but also in this country as well. And in addition, the, the overwhelming kind of background radiation of the climate crisis as well, and the Extinction Rebellion demonstrations. There's a whole host of issues. And for many of us, there are personal things as well that we're, we're wrestling with. There may be personal things to do with mental health issues that for many of us have been exacerbated during the lockdown. And so into the future as well, we don't know what's going to happen. And so this series on lamentation and worship seems to me to be a, a great idea, being able to bring our, our experience, our emotions, our feelings into worship into our spirituality and into our, our, our corporate worship together uh, as God's people. Uh, Psalms, I'm going to read Psalm 137 to you in a moment, but the Psalms are the songbook of the Bible. They're the songbook of the temple, the worship of the temple. And so these are uh, corporate songs, but they're also intensely deep personal songs as well. An Old Testament uh, scholar uh, Walter Brueggemann, divides the Psalms into three different kinds. Psalms of orientation, Psalms of disorientation, and Psalms of reorientation. Psalms of orientation are the ones that go, God, you're brilliant, everything's fantastic, amen. Psalms of disorientation are, God, everything's terrible, everything's falling to bits. Psalms of reorientation go through the disorientation, everything's falling to bits, and then reconciles it at the end. It's reoriented to everything's wonderful, everything's uh, falling to bits, everything's collapsing around me, but God, you're faithful. I trust in you. So it kind of goes in that kind of journey. This psalm is a psalm of disorientation. It's one of the psalms of lament, one of the psalms of sorrow, of sadness, of expressing, of getting out that sorrow from deep within our hearts and, and getting it out there. Now, sometimes we think of lament as really negative, bit of a downer. And most of our songs, many of our songs in evangelical churches, Baptist churches, charismatic churches, are upbeat, positive, full of faith and optimism. And we often don't allow room for songs of lament. Uh, during covid uh, there have been some songs written which are acknowledging uh, the sadness more, but still the balance seems to be emphasis on the positivity, and that's important to get us through. But sometimes we need to be, express, be able to express this sadness deep within our hearts. So I'm going to read to you 
uh, Psalm 137. And it goes like this. And if you remember the Boney M song, uh, you can sing along with it as well. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. What a terrible, terrible ending. It is noteworthy that Boney M in their song, the disco version, didn't read the final verse of this psalm. In the orientation, disorientation, reorientation, this psalm is solidly in the disorientation camp. It is a psalm of lament, of disorientation, of experience of disaster. That's what it is. Amazing. I want to deal with this with you, just to unpack it and unfold it with you under four headings, because this is a, a cry from the heart, a cry, a deep cry, a gut cry. It's a cry of history. It's a cry of justice. It's a cry of emotion. And it's a cry of healing. So the cry of history, first of all, thinking about the context, the background to the passage, because we can really only understand the Bible if we understand the context as well. First of all, uh, they're talking about by the rivers of Babylon, the people of Israel, the leaders at least, are in exile in Babylon. They've been sent there uh, by God as a judgment on them for their sin and their idolatry and their injustice. And they're there as uh, prisoners of the Babylonian Empire. And they're saying, that's in verse 1, verse 2, it says, we can't sing about Jerusalem here in exile. It's so painful. All we can do is be silent. We are grieving. We are mourning. We are suffering loss. That's a deep, incredible emotion to be feeling. And during covid Many of us have experienced that sense of loss, that sense of mourning, maybe actually mourning people who have passed or mourning our normal everyday lives which have gone. Hopefully we'll be back in some form in the future, but at the moment we feel like perhaps we are in exile, that we are a long way from home, that we are suffering, maybe to do with the COVID, maybe to do with the personal reasons. And then it says the captors, the Babylonians, demanded songs. Sing us songs of joy. Sing us one of those old songs, those old favorite spirituals, those gospel songs. Sing us one of those that you used to sing back home because they, they get us moving. It's a little bit like in the Caribbean or the southern United States. The slave masters would demand the slaves to sing and dance for them, to do a jig, to entertain the masters. Or in Nazi Germany during the concentration camps, the, the, the Nazi guards would get the musicians, the classically trained musicians, violinists, cello players, to come and play Johann Sebastian Bach uh, before the captives, before the, the prison guards uh, in the extermination camps. That's what they were being asked to do. And they said, we can't do that. We can't sing those songs. Our hearts are so torn in half. 
And in verse 7, we, we understand that it's not only Babylon that's done this. Their neighbor, their cousins in the nation of Edom have also joined in when Jerusalem was destroyed. and said, tear it down, tear down the city of Jerusalem. Even their neighbors and their cousins were against them. How is that when our nearest and dearest turn against us? This is what they were experiencing. This is what they were feeling at a deep gut level. And then, you know, it just switches from a psalm of lament to what we call the imprecatory psalms. Imprecation means to curse, to wish evil on somebody. And there are a number of different imprecatory psalms, and they're really hard to read, hard for us to take in. But it switches from even just a psalm of disorientation to a psalm of disintegration. And they just say, blessed is the one who will destroy you. Blessed is the one who will take your baby and smash it against the rocks. There's a, it's shocking. It is terrible. What is that even doing in the Bible? I mean, in Romans chapter 15, Romans chapter 15, Paul says this. Everything that was written in the past, the Old Testament, was written to teach us. What? So this Psalm 137 is there to teach us? What is it supposed to teach us? What's it supposed to do? How are we supposed to learn from this? It, it is deeply shocking, terrible, horrible. It goes from sadness to destruction to wishing destruction on Babylon and even on its children, on its babies who might be considered to be innocent. And you might think, oh, it's, it's just the... Because we're living in the New Testament. Jesus says to love your enemies. And God is a God of love, it says in the letter of John. But it's not just the New Testament that says that. It's the Old Testament. In Psalm uh, 24, in Proverbs 24, verse 17, it says, Do not gloat when your enemy falls. When they stumble, do not let your heart rejoice. So the Old Testament it says, says, itself says, don't have the attitude that they had at the end of Psalm 137. It's not how you're supposed to react. But they did. What does this have to teach us, as it says in Romans? Oh, everything written in the past is written so that we can learn from it. What are we supposed to do with this psalm? What are we supposed to do with this? Is it really the word of God? Psalms like this lead some people to think, oh, the Bible is not the word of God. It's just a, a human book. I really believe this psalm is in here for a reason to teach us. And we can learn from it. So we've got the cry of history. We come to the cry of justice. This psalm is a reaction, is a response to injustice. It is a response to oppression. It is a response to exile. It is a response to slavery. And the anger is an anger against injustice. And we can think about it as like this. Those of you perhaps are older, maybe growing up in Britain when you were young, maybe you were alive at the end of World War II. And maybe you have seen, and many of us have seen on newsreels and historical film, the absolute destruction of Germany. If you look at the cities of Germany in 1945, they were just a shell. They'd been bombed to bits. It was kind of the consequence, the result of their warmongering and their aggression and the Holocaust. There's a cause and effect, a sowing and reaping in history, in reality, in politics, in military uh, terms. They reaped what they had sown. You sow the wind, you reap the whirlwind. This is what was happening then. Or think now, when we've got the protests in the United States, particularly even here as well, about Black Lives Matter. But how that has over, overflown, over, overflowed into riots and destruction, destruct, destroying shops, destroying um, 
even their people's own neighborhoods because of the anger at the injustice that they were feeling. And so anger against injustice is a good thing. And that's what they were expressing. That's what the Psalm 137 was expressing. You see, some of us don't care enough about injustice. Some of us don't feel the pain of injustice against other people. We feel it against ourselves, of course, but we don't feel it about anybody else. We don't say, I'm going to stand up for you in your suffering and your pain and the injustice against you. I got an email from a friend of mine in the United States this week, uh, and they were saying that uh, it was as a woman, it was a middle-aged woman, black woman, and she was saying that she was frightened. She said, it's a dangerous time to be a black person in the United States. And she said, me and my husband have worked out a plan for what to do if I'm pulled over by the police. To have the talk, as it's called. There is a justifiable, understandable anger and injustice. But some of us, we don't really care about that. So we don't get moved by it. We don't want to do anything. We're, we're kind of complacent. We don't feel strongly about it, and maybe we should, but actually we're indifferent. Whether it's about starvation in other countries, whether it's about race and racism, whether it's about the predicament of our next door neighbor who is sinking into mental illness and loneliness. Over COVID, perhaps for many of us, our feelings have been dulled and we've just been settled into watching TV, watching the internet, just kind of going through things without feeling too deeply. Some of us have felt a lot. But this is the issue. We should feel, we should emo feel emotion. I remember I was doing my driving lesson and the guy knew that I was, I was a student pastor. I was looking after students in the university at the time. We talked a little bit about it. And one day he came in, he was really agitated. Uh, and he said to me, tell me what you would do. His nephew's child had been sexually abused by somebody. And he wanted me to tell me what I thought. Because he expected me to say, oh, we should forgive. We should forgive the perpetrator because God is mercy. And he just feel angry. And I had to tell him, you know, God feels angry when a child is abused. God is not complacent. He is angry at injustice and harm and pain that is inflicted upon people. Whether that is racism, whether that is starvation, whether that is abuse. God has a divine anger. The problem with our anger is it's not always divine. Sometimes it's just our own selfish emotion. But there is a justifiable response. And sometimes even the reaction that goes too far can still be understandable. And so the first thing we need to learn from this is there is a cry for justice. Justice for the oppressed. And God cares. And it's in the word of God. I'm not justifying the whole sentiment about throwing, smashing their babies against the rocks. But the emotion at the, at the injustice of exile and oppression was understandable. The next cry is the cry of emotion, you see. It's a cry of feeling. It's a cry from the heart. It's a cry from the deep gut of our feelings. And sometimes, you know, as nice Christians, we just want to be calm and peaceful and loving and holding hands and hugging. Except we're not allowed to hold hands and hugs at the moment. But you know what I mean. We want to put on a good front. We want to put on a face. We want to put on a mask. We're used to these, these COVID-19 masks. Well, a lot of us wear masks all the time so that we don't show our feelings especially the negative feelings and that might be for understandable reasons so we don't hurt people but it may mean that we're not really honest with others and honest even with ourselves because sometimes we wear masks to ourselves so we don't even know what we're feeling the bible though is real and is realistic and is about real life and about real raw emotions it's about honesty and intensity of emotion and feeling. But for many of us as Christians, we're, you know, I don't know about you, but we're taught just to hold our emotions in. Don't let them out. We cut off 
the negative emotions. We, 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 we don't even bring them to God. I mean, God knows about them. Maybe we think, if I don't talk about my anger, if I don't express my anger before God, he won't know. But he knows. Even when we're repressing our anger, even when we're stuffing our anger down and trying to be calm on the outside, and nobody else knows, God knows. He knows all the depth of our feelings. And he wants us to bring them to him. Sometimes we, in prayer, we, we don't talk about the negative things. We talk about the nice things. Help me to love so-and-so. Lord, bless them. We don't say, God, I really hate their guts at the moment. Maybe we should. You know, sometimes people say to me, you know, Steve, I, I just feel like I'm swearing when I'm praying. I shouldn't do it. But, you know, God can take your swear words. Other people might not be able to take your swear words, but God can take them. But we cut off our negative feelings and our emotions from God. And what this psalm tells us is that we can bring our feelings to God. We can be open and honest with God. That is the doorway to healing, which is the next cry I'll talk about in a moment. But we bring the whole of our life into God in our relationship to God, including the negative. We don't need to hold it back in this psalm. The psalmist is able to express their deep feelings, even the horrible feelings, in prayer to God. A lot of mental illness, you see, is, 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 is involved in this. Sometimes we, we don't even know what we're feeling. We have what psych psychologists call a lack of affect. Affect means emotion. We're not even aware of our emotions. We, we don't feel our emotions. We might be feeling angry, for example, but we push it so far down, we're not even aware of it. And it's a real problem when we can't even be aware of what we're feeling and we can't therefore express what we're feeling. I'm not talking about losing our temper. That's being out of control. But expressing what we're feeling is important. A lot of depression, they often say, is anger turned inwards. If we feel like we're not allowed to express our emotions, express our anger, and it turns back against ourselves, that's what many kinds of depression really are. Or again, some people say that depression is about mourning that is incomplete. We've not really been able to express or even acknowledge our mourning and our loss. So that's about expressing our feelings in prayer and in our relationship with God. Final the cry of healing. Before we can be healed, before we can forgive other people, we need to first acknowledge, face up to, recognize, admit our own anger, resentment, bitterness. While we can't do that, while we don't do that, we block off God's healing. And we can't even truly forgive. We say, oh, I forgive that person. Of course I do. But actually it's still bitter deep down inside. Of course, forgiveness needs to, become, to come back to again and again and again. Because the feelings kind of come back and begin. It's not a finished work. It's a continuing work. It's not just we forgive one day and then it's all gone. It can take time. It can take years to truly forgive somebody that has really hurt us. But if we don't admit, at least to ourselves and at least to God, that they've really hurt us, we can't be healed. Whether we've experienced racism, abuse, exclusion of different kind, bullying when we're a child, whatever it may be. There is healing from God for that for us. The precondition is to face up to it so that we can forgive truly and then receive God's healing. In Hebrews 12, 15, it says, take care that no bitter root grows up among you and defiles others. Bitterness can defile our relationships and other people. But the pathway to healing is to express what we're feeling to God, to lament, to show it, to share it. Jesus is the doorway to healing. He is the answer to the cry of our heart for healing. He taught about love, but he also took all of the violence, the anger, the resentment of our world and of ourselves our deepest anger, our deepest resentment, our deepest violence that we're not even aware of sometimes. He's taken it all on the cross. And when we come to him, not just in conversion, but as we come to him now as Christians, as believers, and we open up and we let the cross come into our lives, we find healing for ourselves. But it needs us to acknowledge and to open up. That's why lament 
That's why being honest about our feelings in prayer is not to be pushed off to one side, but brought straight in, right in to the heart of our personal relationship with Jesus. I'd like to pray with you now. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that we can be honest in prayer. Thank you that we can bring to you all our deepest feelings and deepest emotions. Lord God, we pray for those places in our lives where we've experienced oppression, where we've experienced rejection, where we've experienced abuse, prejudice. Lord God, we bring it to you. We bring to you our anger. We bring to you our bitterness. And we ask you to heal us because we need you. Just open ourselves up before you, Lord. May the cross, the cross of Jesus come and bring healing to our lives because we know that on the cross, you, Jesus, took everything, all our pain, all our suffering, all our hurt on yourself. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you uh, for being with me and allowing me to be with you. Remember, Jesus is the doorway to healing and the cry of our heart is answered by the cross. Amen. Thank you for those wonderful words of inspiration. Let us pause for a moment. Having heard those words of encouragement, what one thing will you take away from today's message? I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to help you to apply that one thing to your week. We will now have our closing song.
As we come to the end of the service, I'd like to leave you with the words of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, from John 14, verse 26 to 27. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Saints, we are not alone. God is in control. Let us say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Have a blessed and safe week.